Hi, this is Jessica Cameron, and I'm on WithoutYourHead.com. Welcome back to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm still Nasty Neil. And I remain terrible, Troy. Mm. And returning here to the show, Connor Frazier. Hi. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, I was preoccupied. Well, that's all right. And Nathan Forrest Winters. It's uh, it's awesome to have both of you guys back. Yeah, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be great back. back. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, can you guys give us an update of whereabouts the babysitter is right now? Well, um, <laughs> we are in the process of retooling it. Um, we had a cut done, and I, I, I think you know we had people you know who had looked at it, and people you know, people had seen it, kind of floated around a little bit, and it wasn't something. I don't think people were getting it, and I personally just wasn't happy with it. So the big thing now is taking it back really to the roots of what Nathan and I had come up with in the beginning, which was, um, it was a lot different than the cut we had. (laughs) Um, yeah. So that's what we're in the process of doing now is we're trying to finish up some filming and then we're going to try to hunker down together and get this thing edited (laughs) properly. Mm -hmm. So Nathan, were were you hands on in the editing uh, of the first cut? Um, just at the very end of it, um, I mean, we tried to do the whole, like, you know, cause Connor's on the East coast and I'm on the West coast. So it was like this nightmare of uploading and downloading from the drive. And like, right. it was just, it was, it was insane. You know, like, I think we started out what Connor, you'd edit like 10, 15 minutes and then send it to me to score. Yeah. And then I'd have to, then I yeah. have to render it and, and upload it. And then he'd have to download it and. So it's just, you know, it was just a process that was a nightmare. So at one point I just said, here, here's all the music, you know, you go ahead and, and edit it and then send it to me when you're done and I'll, you know, do any touch up I need to do with the, with the score. And, um, I think I maybe added just a, maybe 30 seconds worth of footage, um, to it. And that was it. So, I mean, I was involved somewhat, but I, I really, I gave the reins to Connor cause that was the easiest and, you know, the best solution to get it done in any kind of, you know, yeah. feasible time frame Cause it was, it was ridiculous, it was ridiculous trying to do the whole, you know, sharing through the, the drive. So, yeah. So do you think though, doing a first cut, even if you weren't happy with it, will help like, uh, you know, for the next uh, version of the film? Um, I mean, I guess to some extent, I mean, there's really nothing different in terms of like editing. I mean, I think it's more of um, like having your head in the right place. And I think so much went on because we all, we did all of this essentially by hand and with, you know, funding from people that were interested in hearing the story. So it, it could become overwhelming. And I think that was the problem at the end was that it all got very over- overwhelming and it just wasn't fun at the end. So you're not really in a place where you're going to think outside of the box. You're just like, I just want to get it done. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of outside elements and um, things too, that really would put in pressure on, you know, like from distribution company and, and, you know, uh, other platforms and avenues of, you know, people that wanted to help us with the movie. So it was all, you know, with a good intention, but at the same time it was put, it was putting a lot of pressure on us to um, get it done under a deadline. And, you know, anytime that's done and you don't have like a budget that's bottomless or, you know, like in our instance, like really any budget, um, mm-hmm. it makes it near impossible. And you're always going to end up compromising things that you originally had wanted to see in the film or, you know, and that's really what it came down to was it was, you know, we we're getting pressured to, to have it done because it was sort of like, you know, with the Weinstein thing and just the way that everything was progressing in, in the media and, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, that people were actually talking about it is like this generating this kind of hype, you know, which was going to help the movie pr- be propelled into, you know, meet, meet its potential. But, you know, what it did was it, it put Connor and I both under a lot of pressure to, to, co- and we ended up having to compromise. And mm-hmm. personally, Connor may not be happy with it, but I'm just going to put it out there. I think it's a beautiful film. And, you know, at some point, you know, down the road, once, once, you know, we have the, um, one that Connor's happy with that we can both agree on out there, you know, at some point I, I'll probably hold on to that original copy and try to do a DVD release or something with it, because I think the film is, is, you know, 
a very it's a very um profound and compelling film and it's very unique and um i think it's beautiful it's you know but again yeah. it's not really what um we had envisioned to begin with and it's mm-hmm. really difficult for someone who has never you know lived through abuse or lived with anyone that's been abused like that um to kind of grasp it you know what i mean anyone that mm-hmm. has viewed it that that has experience as a as a survivor or a victim got mm-hmm. it like without any question you know mm-hmm. um but it was more the people that you know the the general the the you know population that wasn't really i think it it's not geared towards them as much so mm-hmm. you know it's not necessarily we're compromising or you know selling out to make to appease some man that's in a suit saying i don't like your film or i don't get it it's mm-hmm. more like if we want people to be receptive to it and to, to get it, then we have to, you know, kind of approach it from a place where they can understand it too, not just right. victims yeah. or survivors. Just to make it more so. relatable. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, uh, Nathan, what was this whole experience like for you? Like <clears throat> to revisit these memories, I could see how it could be negative or uh, maybe both positive and negative to, to get yeah. it all out there. It's definitely been a bit of both. You know, like I've, I noticed certain, um, you know, like bad patterns or like dysfunctional patterns wanting to like rear their heads again, you know, after going through this and, um, like a lot of doubt and a lot of guilt, not guilt, but, um, you know, that it's like residual stuff that is still there, but Mm -hmm. I've already overcome it. So like, I'm like this time aware of what's going on. So it's totally a different experience than it was when I originally, was having to tackle these kind of, you know, dysfunctions and issues that, that you carry with you after being abused like that. Um, you know, so in that sense, it's been both positive and good and negative because it's a negative because it's not easy to do something like this when you're constantly second guessing yourself and doubting and like having that little voice of, you know, like the negative in your head, constantly telling you that you're crazy and nobody's going to get it. Nobody wants to see it. Like, you know, all these things that, um, you know, most people get so, but at the same time, it was very positive because I was able to recognize it and deal with it in a different way. That was much quicker than the original time, you know, that I was getting over right. these things when I was, you know, in my, in my teens and mm-hmm. stuff. So, uh, it's definitely been an experience, you know, it, I wasn't prepared for that at all, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. to have sort of stuff that I thought I'd overcome, be right there, kind of just waiting for a weakness to it, you know, kind of latch on and attack again and, so I was a little unprepared, but I, I think I, I managed it pretty well. Yeah. I'm managing it well. Yeah. When you said a little while ago about how like uh, the movie changed, like from what you're, you originally like the original concept, is that mm-hmm. kind of some of the reasons? Like, because then when you start to actually talk about all these things, uh, the kind of the whole shape of what you're doing might change. You know, f- uh, as far as the documentary. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Neil. <laughs> it's it's funny because like if Connor's going to remember this, I get out there and I'm like, well, wait a second. I, I kind of didn't even count on the fact that I'm going to be on screen this whole time. You know what I mean? Right. right. Can we just do like voiceovers <laughs> or something? Uh-huh. You know, I don't like seeing myself on screen. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like this, I didn't think it that far ahead. I was just like, okay, I'm going to tell my story. It's going to be done the way it's never been done. And it's going to be told by me this time. And then, I got there to do it. I'm like, Oh shit, wait a second. (laughs) (laughs) You know, kind of third, you know, actually thinking it through and realizing that this meant I had to be on camera and this meant that, you know, I had to sort of dig through these dark, dark waters to, to Mm -hmm. uncover these memories that have been buried by time and, and like just our natural defensive instincts to, you know, to protect Mm -hmm. and survive. And so, um, you know, that was, it was a process, you know, and, and the way that we did it was like 13 days, I think. Right. Connor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirteen days, and you know that's like no time at all to, because Connor and I hadn't met in person at that point yet either. You know, we'd mm-hmm. only had discussions over the phone and and through, um, you know, texting and stuff. And so, you know, we just as we're like kind of starting to get our our groove together and start to really, you know, see how we could work, you know, with each other and bounce ideas and and mm-hmm. you know, kind of coordinate what we wanted to do and what we wanted to see. It was time for me to go, mm-hmm. and. uh so, you know, that made it difficult too, but yeah. yeah. And when you guys, so when you guys do f- meet for the first time, cause obviously, uh, when the movie's out, a lot of people will see it, but that's not the same as actually talking to someone about it. So I would think that to be a lot of trust between the two of you, you know, to sit there and, and 
be so open and vulnerable. Mm-hmm. So yeah, did, was there was that there right away, or uh, did it take a while for, for you to like feel comfortable with Connor? Um, no, it was pretty much. I mean, we'd had so many. You know, we spent several hours on the phone together at that point, and um, mm-hmm. for me, the only way that I could do this was to yeah, basically, I guess you would have agreed to it in the first place. Yeah. Right. I mean, I had to like pretty much, you know, because of because of just the elements and because we're doing it ourselves and there's like absolutely really no, um, you know, anybody sponsoring or anybody, you know, contributing to make this happen really just other than my Connor and myself, it was like, it was just, it was one of those things I had to say, okay, either you give it all to him Mm -hmm. or it's nothing. So it's just like, you know, after we decided to do this, I just told Connor, I said, okay, well, this is your department and you have my full confidence, you know? And I, that was tested a few times, you know, throughout definitely where, you know, at one point he came to me and he was like, okay, so I'm going to reshoot some stuff. And, and, you know, and he starts telling me about this like side story that he wanted to add into it. And I'm just like, what are you doing? What are you talking about? What do you mean? You're going to, you know, like, what does that mean? You're, and, you know, but again, I had to curb that instantly and be like, okay, squash it. I gave uh-huh. you my full confidence and that's what that means. So, you know, I trust you to do what, you know, to do it right. And so, and again, I thought that his original edit was, of it was just beautiful. I thought it was, you know, I mean, it's very dark, but it also has a lot of healing, you know, like it has, shows a lot of the healing and, and it gives you the tools sort of, of, you know, that I had to discover in order to, to heal, in order to get over it. Those are all in place. And, and so in that regard, it's very much the film that I wanted to see. Mm-hmm. And it still will be, you know, it still will be that mm-hmm. film. It will still have all that, all that element to it. But um, definitely I see, you know, after... Um, you know, not getting into any of the film festivals and, and things, you know, we, it was, we were turning it into a positive and saying, okay, well, this is giving us an opportunity to reassess and to kind of try to look at it from a little less, you know, objective sort of non-biased kind of uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Connor? How was, um, cause it's one thing to think, you know, you're going to, you're going to go here and you're going to film this uh, documentary and you kind of know the story. But once you get in there and like, you know, Nathan's right there telling you this, what, what does that do to you? What kind of mindset do you get into? I, I think it was more of a, you know, once, once it got good, it got good, you know, and it sounds kind of fucked up, but it's like, you know, when, when you start tapping into that element, it helps creatively, you know, to keep it going. So I wasn't really, I mean, I, I wasn't experiencing it with him, I guess. I mean, there were moments where there was obvious, you know, emotion and it would kind of shake the whole room, but it wasn't as if I was inside of his head the whole time. I was just translating what he was saying onto film, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the, the scoring process, uh, Nathan, um, well, what was that like to, to score your, you know, kind of your own story? Um, well, that, it's always been a dream of mine um, since I kind of, you know, had that bad taste for acting left in my mouth. Like it was, mm-hmm. I, you know, and then I started playing and writing music at 16. Um, it was just, a, it was a natural thing for me to want to write for movies, you know, because of my love for film and because, you know, my love for, at that point, I, you know, loved, well, really wanted to be an actor. Um, but when I found music, I, I realized that that's really where I'm at, you know, as, and so for the score, it was a very natural process. Honestly, um, I wrote all the music and recorded all the music before ever seeing a piece of the film. It was just all, you know, basically me telling my story through the audio. And so, you know, specifically for the, for the songs that are written for the film, it's each one of them is a, a like a character, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's the boy, which we played live last time we were on your show, yeah. um, you know, which is kind of like my theme. And then there's the monster part one and part two. And then um, like the forgotten, the silence, you know, like the, so it's each each song was kind of like a character or, a you know, an element of what it's like in that abuse to either be, you know, the silenced one or to be the one that's forgotten or, you know, even like with the monster, that song, you know, like Victor's sort of theme, the, the Predator's theme, mm-hmm. it it has an element of beauty to it. 
like there's very specifics about the music like you know there'll be like a string arrangement or like a you know one of those little like bell pianos or something that that is there in place to remind people that you know at some point this monster this predator was in fact a child that was innocent and was abused and like if we want to stop abuse we have to approach it at every level so we need to remember and keep that in mind when we're thinking about what we want to do to this predator to this monster for mm-hmm. his punishment you know because so many people are like just kill him string him up or castrate him or you know what i mean like all these just you know really overboard um solutions that are all based off of their anger for what mm-hmm. this person's done but we need to remember that still is a person that was a child at one point that was abused mm-hmm. you know maybe didn't have the tools or the opportunity to really discover that healing that's there you know so um it was just all based off of that kind of an idea that i wanted it to be to tell its own story and to each song to have be, be a character in its own and then it was just a matter of once i had the, the product from connor it was finished you know i just had to make sure that they were put in the right spots Mm-hmm. So, sir, sure. uh, Connor, when when you started to to watch the the stuff you filmed with the score, uh, did it work right away for you? Could you feel you know what what Nathan was doing with the music? Yeah, I mean, it, he had started scoring it while we were filming, so you know it really was. It, it wasn't as if necessarily he just kind of slapped it on after the fact. I mean, a lot of what he was going for, I'd already known about when we were filming. Um, that was, I guess, kind of like his catharsis, maybe, um, you know, after we would film, you know, things would get really emotional and then, you know, he'd go to his guitar and that was that, um, that's how he worked it out. I guess. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but <laughs> that's what I saw. Um, so yeah, now, you know, going back to like the boy and the monster, I mean, that, that's something that survived from like the beginning, you know, like that it's one of those things that was really vital in the beginning that kind of got lost, I think. Mm-hmm. I, I like part of it, right? Wait, what? Connor. I was just saying that what? that's what got lost in the, in the, you know, that's what we're kind of going back to the, to the editing board yeah. for is, is to regain yeah. those things that like that. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the whole idea is that it's, it's very much, the original thing that we had was that it was going to be from the point of view of both sides. You're going to have the monster's point of view and the boy's point of view. And that's what I've essentially kind of revived now. Um, just it's figuring out because originally the idea that we had would have taken a lot more money. And now it's like thinking outside of the box, looking around in my environment and, you know, the tools that I have and what can I do to make something that's very successful. And, that's where it is now. You know, I've shot a lot of stuff on my own, just things that I could do without Nathan um, from like the monster's perspective. And it's something, it's very suspenseful. It's like, it's like a horror, a horror movie within a documentary, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which I love that idea. I always did. Yeah. This, um, when you talked about, you know, the, you have some like uh, pleasant, I guess, uh, music within the monster theme, um, mm-hmm. and you talked about, uh, did do you? Is it your opinion that you, that uh, that he was uh, abused as a when he was younger, Victor? He told me. He told me he was. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in a way, remember. in a way, it's almost like uh, both those songs are kind of like the say like a coin, two different sides because. Right, in a way, he right. would have been the boy at one point. Right. It, well, yeah, the monster was the boy at one point. That's why they, it that's was why the whole the idea from the beginning. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I mean, it's just that that was the original idea from the beginning. You know, it's, I guess what I was going to say. It was, it, it didn't start out as being, and it never was, you know, even throughout everything, it, it, it never ended up being, you know, Victor's an evil person. You know, um, it's hard, you know, because a piece of me like wishes that, you know, that there was something that could have been done to kind of get that other angle, but you know, you can't really do that. I don't, I don't think he wants to go near it ever again. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he's not happy with us doing it, but that was something I was always fascinated by was every side of it. 
and what was going on, you know, in everybody's minds. Mm -hmm. And that was the original idea was Mm -hmm. taking it and kind of doing this thing where we were getting inside of everybody's head and there was going to be like different sides to each thing. And that was all going to be reflected on film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has there been any, anyone uh, contact you guys to try to stop you from making it? No, uh, there's been, we know that Victor knows about it. We, we've known that since, oh, was that before or after production? Do you remember? It was, um, it was before production because it was, it was not too long after we did our very first interview on without your head. Yeah. I think once it started, like once the dread central took it and then you took it and then, you know, everyone else took it because of that. I think that's when he started to become aware of it. And there's never been any, anybody that's tried to stop it. I think, you know, I'm not going to get inside of Victor's head because I don't know where, where he's at, but I guess my idea, my, my feeling with it was he was probably just going to kind of see what it was going to do. Mm-hmm. Maybe, but even then, you know, there's nothing that really can be done about it. So it's, it's a pretty public story. And I think at this point to fight, it would be absurd, you know, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would be uh, kind of productive on his part, yeah, because right. it would bring you know brings more attention to him, and then to and then yeah, it'd be kind uh, of I mean attention. career suicide at some point, right? I think that's what it seems like to me. It would be you know to try to because it'd almost be like martyring our project, right. you know, right. to, a, to a degree. So mm-hmm. especially now with the whole the Weinstein thing having happened, uh, you know, I think it would be difficult. You know, now we're not trying to do that. You know, we're not trying to tell Victor to stop working. It's just about accountability. You know, you go online and you you rummage through interviews he's done. And it's always this, like he's got one foot in and one foot out. Like he's not totally accountable, but then he kind of is. You know, he he balances it out. So he's still safe, you know. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, for me, you know, being the outsider in this, I feel like accountability would do a world of good in terms of my opinion of him. Yeah. But oh, it kind of goes back yeah. to, you know, what, what Nathan was saying, because people, no matter what the reason they have that, that initial, this anger where like he, he should be killed. And I think, uh, or anyone like that, you know, and, uh, mm-hmm. I think it's easier for people to look that way at something as opposed to like Nathan and yourself saying, that there, there is a person there and there's probably, there was a, he went through the same thing and there's like patterns and there's, you know, reasons. It's not just the, even though it is right. a monstrous thing, it's not necessarily that he is a monster. No, right. no. I, I think, you know, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> Whatever you wanted to say. Sorry. I was just saying that it's a okay. humanization, like we're humanizing again. And that's, that's where I think Neil, you're talking about that's where the difficulty <laughs> comes in with people is because, it's such a heinous thing to do to a child um, that your initial as an adult, you know, or someone that, that doesn't, isn't of that mind of, isn't of a like mind, you know, that it's so heinous and so horrendous and horrific that um, your first thought is just like, kill that son of a bitch. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. if, he, if he's dead, he can never do that to another child. Right. You know, and that's yeah, really so what people go with it. Because, around it. <clears throat> right. Right. You know? And so it's, it's been, uh, you know, definitely a process and an experience for, I think, ho- both Connor and I to kind of, you know, I mean, Connor's totally like that director that wants to be the fly on the wall. You know, I mean, that's totally his his thing. And so you have that aspect of it, but then you have like all my experience to to paint the picture sort of for him to be that fly on the wall and to tell the story from the point of the view of the fly. And that was like kind of the original conception was that, you know, he wanted to be a fly on the wall and I would just kind of paint the picture and he would, you know, show it through his visuals. And so, you know, that's really, it was important for us to step out, like for me specifically to step outside of my own emotion with that's attached to it, you know, and my own Mm -hmm. feelings and kind of approach it from somewhere that wasn't driven by that emotion at all, you know, but more driven from a, uh, like just a, like factual kind of, you know, kind of mind where it's very rational and just factual and everything's, you know, 
this way because it's that way and that way because it's this way and not, you know, putting any kind of emotion into it and just, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was mm-hmm. definitely a process to figure that one out because mm-hmm. that's how it has to be done. If it's going to get the point across that, you know, that we have to find a solution in murdering someone, having that blood on our hands is not a solution. If you ask mm-hmm. me, that's not mm-hmm. a solution. That's not how we're going to fix pedophilia. You know, mm-hmm. that's not how it's going to get fixed. Mm-hmm. So we're, um, that's, that's really, yeah. Understanding that why it happens and, is a way to fit because it, that would just solve that one person that doesn't solve the entire problem. Right. Right. Kind of going back to, you know, the question of had anybody ever tried to stop us? No, but we have had people that have asked that Victor and Nathan meet up and <laughs> shake hands and, you know, I don't know, hug. <laughs> so I've had a lot of that. Oh, uh, really? Probably. Yeah. Never happened, but, Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people that wanted wanted some kind of like a peaceful resolution between the two of them. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. I will say this about that, and just, just specifically, mm-hmm. if Victor was to genuinely come to me and apologize, and like it was genuine, mm-hmm. you know, I would. I mean, I because in my heart, I've already had to forgive him because I'm not going to carry that around. It's not, you know. Mm-hmm. That's just poison to my whole being, you know, mm-hmm. and that's not the kind of person I am. So, you know, I've let it go. I, you know, the thing is, is that it needs to be because of the attention that, that my abuse has gotten mm-hmm. to me, that's a, a way to turn a, po- a negative into a positive, you know? So mm-hmm. with its attention, even though it could have totally, you know, may have just been able to destroy me at one point, you know, because it's mm-hmm. not easy to have to be known as this person, that was abused mm-hmm. and have like that be, you know, in seventh, yeah. eighth, ninth grade, that's not a very easy thing to deal with, yeah. you know? And, uh, so there were times, you know, but it's, at the same time, it's like, you know, um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> I started looking at a gravestone and sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally lost it. Mm-hmm. But, but just, do you remind me what we were talking? What was I saying? It was uh, about the idea of a uh, meeting Victor and him apologizing. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I would, I would not hold a grudge. And if he came to me genuinely and apologized and, you know, said that he realized, I mean, cause the thing is, is I know that he knows it's not okay. You know, it right. comes back to that whole thing. If you have to, if you have to hide it and you have to be secretive about it and you have to lie about it and, and, you know, then that obviously is saying that it's wrong. You know, it's wrong. If you have to do all that all that damage control and do all that, like, you know, preventive maintenance and all these things to keep people from knowing what you're doing, then you know, it's wrong period. You know? So if he was to come to me and tell me that he discovered that it's wrong and that he's, you know, seeking help to, you know, to keep himself to abstain from doing these things and wanted to apologize for what he did to me as a child, I would gladly accept it. You know, like I'm not here to do anything other than to raise the awareness about this, you know, epidemic and to help find a solution mm-hmm. the right way, you know, the, the healthy solution, the one that's going to be a lasting solution, not one that's, you know, temporary band aid by, you know, mm-hmm. so. Did, no, um, do you, I don't know if you can answer this, but do you, th- obviously, like we just said, he knew it was wrong, but do you think in his mind that he knew it, it was damaging to you while it was, while he was abusing you? Or it was more that he knew that it wasn't accepted in society and that's why he would keep it secretive. I think it's probably the latter. I think, you know, that's kind of, you know, like that's another kind of comes, takes us back to the score again. So like in the, in the songs that are um, kind of telling the story of the, of the monster or the predator, it, um, it always has, there's always going to be a track in there somewhere that's running backwards whether it's like a guitar track going backwards or some piano track or some strings, whatever it is, there will be a backwards track in one of the, the songs that are kind of telling the story of the monster. And that's because that represents the, um, their idea of love. You know, mm-hmm. they think that they're loving this child, but it's a completely fucking backwards idea of love, you know, mm-hmm. to, to do that to a child. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's, that's really, you know, where I'm at with it. I think it was definitely something that, because it's frowned upon because he could go to prison for it. These are the reasons that he lies and, and, you know, connives and does all these 
things to, to keep people from knowing the truth of what he does. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still think that there's the boy in there somewhere. You know, Mm -hmm. I still do think that boy's in there somewhere, like telling him like, you know, this is not okay. You know, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but, um, we can pretty much condition ourselves to, you know, ignore anything we want to, if we work hard enough at it. And so I'm sure that voice has been, if it's, you know, I, I want to believe it's there in him, mm-hmm. but you know, if it is, it's, it's been so stuffed down and, and ignored so completely that, you know, maybe he's forgotten it even exists. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what do you guys need now to, uh, to do the, the, the rest of the filming? Do you have a go fund me or anything? Yeah, I started a, Go, a GoFundMe campaign about three months ago um, for, you know, a few different things. Because at that point, it was trying to get, you know, to film festivals. So we had funding to go to film festivals and do sort of like the premieres and, and Q&As and, you know, be present for those things. And um, so we've had to reevaluate and step back. And so, we you know, there's a lot of things. There's like a lot of, has gone on since um, our last interview with me. Um other projects that I've started, like, you know, I'm doing a, um, a series on, on YouTube right now, um, called monster hunters with yeah. Bobby Wolf and, and our friend, Scott Kirk, um, who's a survivor as well. And it's just kind of a platform for, you know, victims and survivors to have a safe place. They can come tell their stories and, and begin that process of the healing, you know, cause it's really breaking the silence is like one of the first main steps to take is mm. to not keep that secret anymore to talk yeah. about it. You know, and so that's really the the goal of Monster Hunters. And then, I mean, there's several other things going on. So yeah, there's still a GoFundMe up. It's 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 uh, taking action, breaking silence is the uh, the specifics on it. Mm-hmm. I know it's a cliche. We, oh, go on, sorry. Go on, Connor. Oh, sorry. No. Just no, you know, sorry. really, you know, to finish this, we need money to get him here. Right. <laughs> like uh, in terms of filming it you know i think we're pretty good you know we've got it figured out but i think getting him here is the hardest part so really you know we we only really need like 200 bucks at this point you know it's like that final stretch yeah yeah so what what's the uh how how many people did you interview besides uh, nathan for, for the documentary um, there's only one other person that we interviewed and that was Bill Bacon, who was a set designer for Clown House, who was friends with Victor up until the, um, he was arrested. Wow. So, uh, yeah. can you talk about, uh, finding him at all? How, how did you, how did you um, know about it to the documentary? I hunted him down on Facebook cause they, he was someone that Nathan had brought up. And I hunted him down, and he didn't read the message for, like, six fucking months. But he finally did, and he was like, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, it was like a two-hour conversation um, where we just went into, I guess, what he saw and, you know, what he felt throughout the whole thing and, you know, his perception of how it went. And his perception of Victor now, you know, they haven't spoken in 20 years, but... I think, you know, I think the last time he said they had even interacted was like an email in like 1999. Um, so just his perception of Victor mm-hmm. and, you yeah. know, what had happened on set. Mm-hmm. I know you don't want to give too much away what's you know, actually in the documentary, but was he aware of what was going on? No. He wasn't aware. He was a part of that crowd where it kind of just smacked him in the back of the head, I guess. And it was like, well, duh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it, you know, it takes them a minute to process it. And I mean, we, we, we talked about a lot of things. I mean, I, I think, you know, he wasn't aware, but he has a certain amount of perception being close to Victor. It's the closest we could get to actually talking to Victor, honestly. I mean, it, it's the closest we can get to that side well, of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a spoiler or not, but they were, you know, they were friends long prior to the the filming of the yeah. house. You know, like, Victor, like uh, yeah. Victor and Bill lived like right down the street from each other at one point, and like my grandma's house is right in the middle. <laughs> you know, oddly enough, but yeah, they knew each other prior to the film. Mm-hmm. 
It was an interesting interview. <laughs> He's a bit of an eccentric guy, but it's you know it went well. Yeah. Uh, did was there ever any plans to include other people, or was it uh, we we was tried? Mm-hmm. I tried to t- track down people that were on the set. Uh, the only other person I was able was to get a hold of. Yeah, the yeah her his aunt was involved for a while and. Mm-hmm. She was like a huge resource in looking, you know, she helped me to kind of map it out in a way that Nathan couldn't. You had, I had like three different angles. I had Nathan, I had his mom and I had her mm-hmm. and his mom, I think for her, it's just, it's something that, you know, you go through that kind of trauma and your brain just kind of releases all of it. And you don't remember. Yeah. And then with Nathan, he only knows so much. And then you have his aunt, who has everything. She has this, yeah. this memory where she can tell you the date, the time, who was there, what they were doing, what, the, what, their, what, what kind of fucking tie they were wearing. You know, like... Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. So she had, she had saved all the, the, the legal documents. She had newspaper clippings. Mm-hmm. She was the one that opened my eyes to a lot of things, you know, the, the like pre Nathan and then kind of posts, you know, things that Nathan wouldn't have known about. Mm-hmm. So even if you didn't, in, she, even if she's not in the, uh, the documentary, she was useful, uh, in, in yeah. you know, making the documentary. Oh yeah. I mean, Absolutely. she, yeah. she helped us get it made. I mean, she helped yeah. us get in a room together and, you know, be able to the do props. it. Right, the props. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she helped with that, and she was like, she was like a consultant for me, looking at you know all of the the facts, you know, and trying to get them figured out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, truly, she she speaks the language of like lawyers, you know what I mean? Like she speaks it fluently, and mm-hmm. so for my mom and my parents who don't speak that language, um, she was elemental in all of it. And then again, like Connor says, the woman has a memory for that stuff like you would not believe. And um, so, yeah, she, you know, she was the one in my family that came forward and took over for my parents as far as battling the lawyers and all that kind of shit. Because my mom didn't know how to do it for one and she just couldn't handle it. You know, I mean, it was too Mm -hmm. much. You know, you got people like stalking you out, parked across your street, like in black vans and tinted windows and shit you know what i mean it's like a lot yeah. for a very small you know blue collar family um mm-hmm. to kind of to take on you know have coppola coming at us and like i mean it was you know it was a lot for my parents to handle and so that's where my aunt came in and and she remembers everything like she was there for every second of it the legal battles and everything and remembers every every bit of it like to the t so mm-hmm. since you since you're more uh, out now uh like on social media and more out there now uh has everyone been supportive is no any yeah no? <laughs> it's like 90 10 uh-huh. yeah 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 it, it's you've like, got um, deeper still, it's, fan. yeah sure i'm still i'm still like have to do twice as much work as like you know to get um half the results as someone else that might be you know talking it's just it's and i think that has a lot to do with just our our culture and how it's turned to social media for everything and you know so right i think that's really one of the biggest battles we have is that people would rather see you know or pay attention to something with some chick with big boobs talking about you know something (laughs) that's not Uh really you know relevant to much and instead of looking at like you know somebody talking about saving the children from being abused so Mm -hmm. you know i think that's one of the biggest battles we have with it Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, like, um, um, I tried to, you know, I asked a lot of uh, conventions about uh, playing the movie, and the and the, the response I got from, from all of them, actually, was they said it would be too much of a downer to play at the uh, <laughs> at a convention. And, and that's uh, what's so sad, man, because this, this thing that I've got, you know, going on on my end, you know, because essentially it's just me until Nathan can get here. Uh-huh. It, it's the perfect thing. It balances, it balances the story with kind of like this, this background plot. It, it's not like a plot plot, but it's, it's enough to where you can be engaged in it. And it's very much like a horror movie, like something like 
Halloween or something like the suspense and the lighting and just the tension. It's very, it's a movie within a movie. And I think that that's, that's so sad because I think it would be perfect. It wouldn't be this thing. And that, that was like what we were saying before was that it was such a dark movie, like the first cut. Mm -hmm. I think it, it didn't need to be as dark. I think there needed to be something because when the Weinstein thing hit, we just got thrown in all these different directions. Uh -huh. And it stopped being a movie that was like for horror fans. And that's something that we had talked about from the beginning. It's like nobody gave two fucks about this story before Weinstein. And the ones that did were horror movie fans. So it's like we needed to do – that's from the beginning. It's what I said is like we needed to do some kind of service to the horror film community because they're the ones that kept this story alive for so long. And they're the ones at the end of the day that funded the majority of it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't think it's, it, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's so sad because I don't think they know just what they're losing. I will say uh, reverse. Cause I start, I just this year, I started to do fe the festivals and uh, the people have asked about the, in the festivals, uh, they seem much more uh, into it, into the idea of having it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's that's great, you know. And that's something we're looking at. We've got all kinds of different angles, but you know, we're just talking about the conventions. That that one right there just kind of makes me sad because of how much you know we've really tried to give back to the horror community with it, you know, because it was them that kept it alive for so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody else, you know, gives two fucks about Victor Salvo. He's this unknown director until you get into the horror community. And then he's up there with, like, John Carpenter, you know? Yeah, do you think that is why, like, he uh, kind of he kind of flies under the radar? Why he continues to, uh, you know... I know neither of you want him not to work, but the, the reason why it's, it's not, like, a, a big media thing that, that he does do... You know that he yeah. didn't used they've, to direct. They've done a lot to to make sure that that's in place for him, though. We gotta we gotta you know recognize that too. That you know in '95 uh, he he was he released the film Powder, which is right. produced by Caravan, which is a subsidiary of Disney. And you know Eisner from Disney went on you know on record right there in an interview and said you know bold faced lied about the whole thing. You know, saying that they didn't find out about his past until halfway through production and then just decided to keep a closer eye on him and stuff. But meanwhile, you know, there's like Entertainment Weekly's reporting from the set of Powder how it's like, uh, you know, a happy place with dogs and children running around and shit. And, you know, um, you know, and then he goes on to say even more so that it was a one time inappropriate touching incident between a an adult and a consenting minor. Right. So 17 years old. Right, painting this picture of some see, you know, almost eighteen-year-old, and it's so they're like that, right. that's totally you know. Do you see how that puts it in place to where he's going to yeah. stay under the radar though? Because how right. that, but see, it's not even necessarily it's not even necessarily about Disney. You know, like uh, you know, I'm I'm going to give Disney the benefit of the doubt, but even if you don't look at the production company, because there's plenty of interviews with people that were involved in the actual production who were completely blindsided by it, and you can tell by the way they're talking that they had no clue. Even if Disney did, you know, even if you believe that Disney did, you know, I think the production company, there was not a chance they knew. And they had all said the same story was that his agent had said that Nathan was 17. So at the end of the day, you know, I don't know if you can necessarily blame it on the powers that be or if you could blame it on his own fucking agent, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I mean, obviously to anyone, but, you know, if, if someone would say it was 17 year old, it's like, well, technically that's Nobody wrong. Cares. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. It's like, well, it's like, but if it's someone who's, you know, preview best, then it's totally you no know, different. No right. one, no one, day. no one it's, with like, you know, you know no, no, a 29 year old, a 29 year old and a 17 year old is night and day to a 29 year old and an 11 year old, you know, right. like nearly 12 oh, years. God, yeah. I mean, that's a big gap. Yeah. You know, I didn't even have, I didn't even have pubic hair, you know what I'm saying? Like when he was arrested. Like, it's that kind of a difference where it's like, that's a child compared to an almost adult, you know, a young adult compared to a child, mm -hmm. you know? So it is, it is very calculated how they word that, because as soon as you hear those words, 
adult and consenting minor, your mind goes to somewhere where it's like, you know, maybe a 17 year old about to be 18 at the worst, maybe a 16 year old that's about to be 17. Right. I mean, that's just where your mind goes when you hear those words together, adult and consenting minors. So it was very, in my opinion, calculated to put the wrong idea in people's minds, which would basically better, you know, they'd, they'd be more willing to dismiss it and not like, you know, focus on the fact that he was, you know, having sex with a six year old, you know, seven year old child. until it's almost, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. very calculated the way that they were. And it was such a weird, it was such a weird leap between like his second movie, his second movie that year was nature of the beast. And that was like, nobody saw that. And then he goes to Disney, you know, it's a really weird jump. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, pre, I guess internet was around, but not, not to the extent it is today. So yeah. if, uh, if that would yeah, have been no more modern, it would have been, it would have been a much bigger deal, I think. I mean, look at what happened with Jeepers Creepers 3. You know, I mean, that was a complete shit show. And I think that was a, a lot, had a lot to do with the internet. And I, I do feel bad for fans of the series who had waited 15 years and then got screwed over. But I think now people are a lot more cautious. You know, they're not going to fuck with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're definitely, production companies are much more cautious to work with them now. I mean, what Look to the Sky Films did in 2016 when they had it on their table, you know, was just, for one, it was totally, you know, a bunch of, you know, kissing ass and bullshit, you know, trying to get me to sell out. And, um, and as soon as I decided not to, they, you know, they decided to pass on the project and, you know, didn't return a phone call kind of thing. So they're, they're definitely, you know, more cautious about working with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, about back to the, your uh, your project, the babysitter. Um, I guess because uh, I know about like uh, what you're talking about the the, the um, kind of the subplot in the movie, but maybe some people don't know what you're talking about uh, listening yet. Can you kind of explain okay. what that is? So the idea with it is that you're going to kind of have interspersed into the film this narrative. You know, there's going to be moments where Nathan's not on the screen. And it's going to be <clears throat> just a voiceover dialogue. And with that, there's going to be scenes that are going to take place in two different areas. It's going to be the point of view of the monster and the point of view of the child. And it's, it's set in this creepy environment. Like, it starts out with this apartment, and it's a fucking wreck. And there's, like, fruit flies everywhere, and, you know, there's shit strewn every, all over the place. There's, like, cats licking out of the fucking sink. You know, just all this kind of, you know, halfway normal, halfway not. You know, it's like, it's like a bachelor's hell, you know. And then you're going to have this, there's this back room. And in this back room, there's a child. And the child is playing with toys, and it's kind of acting out a scenario with the toys that I guess kind of express how it feels kind of like when, when you're in therapy as a child and they'll use toys to kind of help you to better express what you're feeling, Mm -hmm. but it's all, it's going to be very, it's like going to be like the toys aren't going to be necessarily normal. It's going to be kind of like a David Lynch nightmare to some extent with the toys. (laughs) Um, I love that description. So it's, it's very much like, the, from the monster's point of view, it's very much like I took a lot of inf- inspiration from like Halloween and just kind of watching the way that, especially that beginning, you know, with the, the POV shot and just the way that Myers kind of sneaks around. That was the idea that I had. A lot of it's POV, not all of it, but a lot of it is POV from the monster's angle. Now, from the child's angle, it's not POV at all. It's filmed from the point of view of a camera that's been hidden under a heap of laundry mm-hmm. oh, shit. which is a direct it's a direct allusion to something that victor actually did <laughs> he filmed children mm-hmm. showering and he would hide the I'm camera sorry, under a leaf of laundry yeah mm-hmm. wow <laughs> interesting that's that's, that's brilliant <laughs> yeah i gotta say I mean, not to, you know, 
but I, I didn't know about that idea yet. You know, Connor and I. Yeah, there's been surprises. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's 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 definitely a surprise. I I love it. <laughs> I love it. You knew I would though. I'm sure you knew I would. Mm-hmm. God. There's, so there's it's a, a little more, you know. It's a little more like movie. You know, it's not as found footagey because I wanted it to look like a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the stuff with the kid is very much, you know, cause it's shot on a video camera. So it's going to have kind of that blurred out look just, you know, because it was shot on videotape, but the stuff involving the monster is crystal clear. And it's, it's like, uh, I don't know how else to describe it, except it's like watching a horror movie, you know, and it's watch, kind of watching the monster, whoever that is, the force, I guess, you know, kind of mm-hmm. just stalk, you know, mm-hmm. there's a scene where, through the monster's eyes, it's stalking through a neighborhood to this specific house where the boy lives, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's very, there's a scene where, um, at the very beginning of the movie, it's just this close up on this doorknob and behind the door, you can hear like this very faint whimpering sound. And then the doorknob just starts to shake violently as if somebody's trying to get out. And the doorknob is stopped and then the camera kind of moves up and the bathroom, the bathroom is like right there. So the door is wide open. You can kind of see this, this figure for a faint second walking across reflected through the mirror, stuff like that, you know, suspenseful, you know, no blood, no guts, not a straight horror movie that we would know today. Something like, like I said, like Halloween, Michael Myers, you know, this sneaking around. Mm -hmm. So, where where did like the idea to include uh, include that in a documentary come from? We had never wanted it to be normal. Mm-hmm. We had never yeah, wanted it to no. be a typical yeah. Never wanted it to be a typical documentary. I mean, I personally think an open secret kind of you know trumps that. You know, when it comes to documentaries about child abuse, that's one of the best there is. You know, there's no competing with that. Not that we even wanted to. Mm-hmm we wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea from the beginning was this kind of these POV shots in this, this house, you know, like this twisted scenario kind of taking inspiration from Nathan's like what he remembered, you know, being at Victor's apartment, you know, and how it would look and kind of just, you know, embellishing it because it's a horror movie. It's not necessarily the character isn't necessarily Victor, it's just a representation of this force, you know, the, the, it's the energy that you would mm-hmm. get from a predator, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, what? go ahead. No, I was, I, I said, we're going to say that I'll ask the next question. <laughs> I just, I was just, yeah, I, I have nothing else to say. I'm good. All right. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I was just going to ask though, yeah. once you do, once you do get this, uh, the final cut, uh, what are your plans to do with it? I think we'll probably try to do everything over again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've thought about, you know, taking it to some of the people that we've been turned down by, you know, being like, look at what we've got now. But, you know, it's not about appeasing them like Nathan said. It's just, you know, showing it, I, it's something that I'm very proud of already, you know, and I think it's something that, people are actually going to want to see as opposed to something that, you know, it's going to be very niche. You know, I think it's still going to be a little niche, but it's going to be something that more people can enjoy. And I just kind of want to show it to everybody again and say, okay, look at this, you know, like, look at this thing. We've really done something different here. Mm -hmm. It's a little, it's a little, you know, typical, you know, it's a little bit of a typical movie. It's a little kind of surveillance and it's a little bit documentary. Mm-hmm. It's unique. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I yeah, do think I, uh, the, I do think the festivals is is a good choice. Uh, once yeah. you get you know the one you want to see. Well, you know, but what I'm you know even with that because of timing. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But even with that, you know, and you know, festivals are great, and but I really when it comes to like conventions and all that, cause that was like our first big thing. It was like, we're going to have to kind of try to take it here and then float it to festivals. And because, you know, when it comes to festivals and stuff that we're not necessarily going to be in front of an audience of people who are going to get it, you know, it's something I was really 
as much as I want to send it to festivals and get it out on DVD and do all that, I really want to have that convention experience and watch people that know what we're talking about, that have known about it for years, and let them see it first. You know, like that's like my big thing. And, you know, even with, oh, well, it's, it's going to be a downer. Well, you know, not everybody has to go fucking watch it, you know? Uh-huh. It's not like, you know, and it, we're not going to, like, force everybody into the screening room or whatever. You know, right. I think, but I think well, there's I enough mean, of an audience. I mean, just, I don't, I don't really get the whole what is, defines the downer thing. I mean, obviously, for several, you know, movies made every year that, you know, or, you know, think about how many movies are downers in total. Downers, oh, yeah, right? I mean, exactly. I mean, so some of not, the, like, you know, the real extreme horror movies are, are very, uh, there's, they're not lighthearted or very depressing. And uh, oh, so the right. fucking shining is in a downer, man. Like, you know, right, you know? right. I mean, you know, clockwork orange, you know, you want to, I mean, yeah. I love Kubrick's, but you know, I mean, that movie is a downer for sure. Like that, you know, mm-hmm. from start to finish, that movie is pretty fucked up, you know, mm-hmm. Like what happens to Alex at the end, and just like you know what I mean, the the old blokes being the the now being the constable, you know, it's just like a. So, I I don't know about the whole downer thing. I think it's just too heavy. You know what I mean? Is what it comes down to. Yeah. Because people can handle downer, people can handle dark, but mm-hmm. you know to have downer, dark and like heavy as fuck all combined. How many yeah. how many mm-hmm. fucking conventions? Have, you know how many people that go to conventions have seen I spit on your grave or like have it in their fucking collection, you know, like uh-huh. that's not a very, that movie's about a girl getting raped by a bunch of hillbillies. Like, I don't think that's, mm-hmm. any, yeah, it's you know, not a right, good movie, right. right. There was a, I was at a convention once where I, I was seated next to Camille Keaton, our booth. And uh, a guy came up and he had a great big back tattoo of, uh, I spit on your grave. And like, at first I was like, Oh, I guess that's, he's a big fan. But then I thought about it and I was like, that's a very weird movie to get like this giant tattoo of on, on your body. <laughs> like I, I don't know how I felt about that. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't throw that out there. But yeah. I don't think anything involving horror movies will feel good. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. But uh, there are uh, horror specific uh, festivals too. Like the I just came from um, a Fright Fest in in London. You know, and it was, uh, it's all horror movies. So, huh. you know, there, there are, and, and, and those people are all well aware of, well versed in, in horror movies. So it could be, uh, the similar idea of what you're looking for. Yeah. That's huh. what I've been trying to shoot for, you know, as much as we're, we're shooting it in any direction it'll go, you know, like if we, you know, we're trying to do festivals, we're trying to do DVD. I mean, it's going to end up on DVD regardless, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah. screaming and whatever. But our hope is we can actually screen it before we do that, you know? And that's my biggest thing. As much as I want to go to festivals, I really want to go to horror conventions and watch people that know what it is, that have invested their childhoods in Jeepers Creepers, you know, to watch this. I, I want to watch their faces. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally fly on the wall. There's coin. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that'll be a. Would you want to, uh, Nathan? Would you want to be there for the screening? He's, I don't know how. Um, what your feeling would be to watch yourself in front of you know an audience plus you know talking about about all this. I don't know what kind of what, how that would be for you. I already I already told Connor that you know any and all premieres or screenings like that I would probably be out in the lobby eating popcorn and candy waiting for it yeah, to be over yeah. so I could talk about it. You know. Because, mm-hmm. you know, again, scoring it and doing all that, um, you know, I had to watch that. I had to watch it several times, like countless mm-hmm. times. And, you know, so I, I, I'm sure by the time, you know, we get it there, I will have seen it plenty of times, <laughs> you know, yeah. and as far as getting people's reactions, you know, like it's not really, you know, it's not something that I'm like all is, you know, it's not like um, something that, like how Connor really wants that, you know, like, and I understand mm-hmm. it, I fully get that. Sure. It's, it's not something that I feel like I need, you know, mm-hmm. it's more, it's more like I would rather hear what they had to say afterwards. I can think kind of thing, you know what I mean? Like, I would like to hear what they say after they've seen the thing and it's, in, you know, complete and, um, and where they stand with it, you know, that's, that's yeah. where my, more, more my interest lies. Mm-hmm. I mean, but obviously, I like you, myself on, you know, 
Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, both of you are invested in different in different ways, so you know you'd have yeah. different uh, yeah. thoughts of watching with an audience. Yeah, I mean, going back to the fruit flies thing real quick. All that shit I shot in my own apartment, so I gave myself fruit flies. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody doesn't get to see this movie, I'm gonna test. <laughs> gave himself fruit flies. That's <laughs> I. I gave myself fruit flies so I could shoot that. <laughs> that's dedication right there. Yeah, yeah that's very, talking very about sacrifice. Much. I mean, come on. <laughs> I love this kid. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Nathan, are, are you going to continue? Uh, we well, continue music, obviously, but uh, would you like to score other movies, or what are you going to do with your music? Oh, absolutely, I would love to score films. Um, you know, that's that's something I've always because I that's that's my way is to tell it through the auditory. You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm not so much about being on screen or, or you know acting things out like that um, at all anymore but the music part is something that I feel very, it's a natural adaptation for me to have made um, because regardless, like the music that I write anyway, you know, is, is a lot of it has that movie score um, soundtrack kind of feel to it. You know, like I get that all the time from people and have for years, they'll hear my stock stuff and be you know, like, this sounds like it should be in a movie. And so, um, yeah, I would love to. In fact, Connor and I have already kind of talked about that a little bit about you know maybe his next project so oh very cool so you guys would continue working together yeah i'm i'm, I'm about it yeah 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 it's very cool and uh, yeah. where can you find the your uh the youtube show uh monster hunters that's um it's uh i think because we, we're just transitioning it was um bobby wolf mm -hmm. um is his, is the channel that's my that's my co-host mm -hmm. uh and um so I believe it's just, it's Bobby Wolf, Wolf Everything mm -hmm. on YouTube um, is a channel. And then, uh, you know, you can find it. We, ha we'll, we have a, uh, you know, my website, NathanForceWinters.com. There is, uh, you know, links to all the episodes and all the music and a bunch of stuff. So a lot mm -hmm. of good content up there. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, uh, Connor, for people who would, uh, so you you said you only need a few hundred bucks to to get this finished. How can they, uh, if someone listening wants to uh, to help out? Um, taking action, breaking silence, the GoFundMe account, you know, whatever you've got, you know, whatever you can, you know, if you want to help, you know, thank you, but <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> it's okay. Well, it's, it, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's been a process. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I always love. I, I have a uh, I have a new enemy. I, you know, I'll just say the airlines are are like one of my enemies right now. <laughs> I hate I hate those <laughs> crooks so much right now, bro. You have no idea. But yeah, they're they're crooks. It's you know. What uh, is there a story there? Just that you know, last year their uh, flight was canceled because of my aunt deciding not to go to Virginia and. So that money's been sitting there in my name, and now like I've been fighting them for three or four months to try to get that money reinstated, so I have a flight. And I mean, it's it's like about eight hundred, you know, eight hundred fifty dollars so far that mm -hmm. in flights that they're trying to give me, I think one hundred and seventy five credit or something like that. It's just ridiculous. It's uh, yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's just like it's unreal how many fees they have, you know. And yeah, because the they, the fees sometimes come come to more than the flight. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah, it's ridiculous. So it's uh, just been a nightmare, you know. Because uh, two years ago, when I, I was had, uh, I was in the hospital, so I couldn't go to. Uh, I had a, a flight to Texas, so I had to cancel it. And I called them up, and they were very good about it at the time. They said, "Oh yeah, no problem if it's a medical thing." Mm -hmm. But then when I went to like uh, you know get another flight with that credit, like it just. Uh, same yeah. way, it's actually never happened yet, and it's been a couple of years. Yeah, now. exactly. There you go. See what I'm saying? And and they get away with it because who's going to spend all the money and legal fees and time and energy that they don't have to go battle this big airline for a few yeah. hundred bucks? You right. know what I mean? So they like, I mean, how many people are they doing that to every year? You know what I'm saying? Right. If they've done it to me twice and twice within a year's time, then I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, uh, I just saying, you know, I got to put it out there so people understand that, you know. The airlines are crooked. <laughs> I agree, because then they oh, yeah. start telling me since well, it's been over a year, so then it's like it's expired, and I was like, well, they told me yeah. there would be no expiration because it was a medical thing, and then uh, they just yeah. kind of go in a big loop that never gets you anywhere. 
besides right, exactly. just making you very frustrated and, and mad right. and angry and put your head through the wall you know <laughs> right exactly. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah so i know exactly what you're talking about yeah so but yeah, i i appreciate both you guys coming on it's always uh i always enjoy talking to both of you yeah it's always great yeah, yeah thank you thank you gentlemen yeah, and I'm definitely yeah, looking you. forward to seeing the uh, the finished movie. Mm, me too. Thank you. I'd yep, be interested very to see much. Both, uh, both copies, both both uh, both cuts. Yeah, <laughs> we'll leak it somewhere. Just, <laughs> <all right>. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. you know, I agree. Again, I got to say, Connor, you know that I think the first cut was brilliant, bro. I, you know, for me, it was it was exactly it was telling it through my eyes. So that's you know what you got was it was the telling through my eyes which again, wasn't exactly what we had planned on from the beginning. So, you know, it's, it's a really good thing that we'll be able to kind of step back and, and look at it again and, and make these, you know, adjustments to it. That way, you know, Connor's totally happy with it too. Cause I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want him mm-hmm. to be unhappy with his, right. his film, you know, at all. Mm-hmm. So. And uh, I want to say for the people listening to the podcast, I'm going to have uh, some tracks for Nathan, from Nathan in the podcast. I didn't have time to set them up for the live show. So uh, if you listen live, you're going to hear Wolfman Chuck and the Brimstone Boys. But uh, for uh, on the podcast, we're going to play some Nathan tracks after this interview. Thank you. Oh, Thank very you. nice. Yeah. All right, guys. It's been uh, it's good. always great to talk to you, and we'll do it again sometime. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. That was awesome, bro. Always a pleasure. And Troy. Absolutely, you guys. guys. Yep. You guys take care. Thank you, Connor. guys. We'll talk Thank you. To you Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right. All right. Good night. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I'm not afraid I'm not afraid The monster's gone 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 gone. The monster is gone.
of countless things Recollecting and collecting fragments the boy I wish I was way back when. The boy I wish I was way back when. The boy I wish I was way back when. I'm recollecting and collecting those fragments of